On the night of August 22, 1991, a crowd of Russians began removing a 14-ton bronze statue in a major Moscow intersection. It was an act that years earlier would surely have cost them their lives. But on this night, as democracy was budding in the Soviet Union, the statue represented all that was wrong with the country. For those in attendance, its removal signified the end of an era. The man whose likeness the 40-foot high sculpture depicted was Felix Zerzhinsky, one of Vladimir Lenin's closest associates. He was the founder of the Soviet Union's first official secret intelligence service, known as the Cheka. After the 1917 revolution, the Cheka began the brutal suppression of any and all opposition to the new communist regime. After Lenin's death, Joseph Stalin consolidated his grip on the Soviet state by utilizing the newly powerful secret service as his personal instrument of control. First, Stalin eliminated his political rivals. Then he unleashed an unparalleled reign of terror against ordinary Soviet citizens. Throughout the 1930s and 40s, millions died in bloody purges at the hands of Stalin's secret police, now called the NKVD. The NKVD spread a deadly network of agents around the world. Assassins routinely murdered ideological opponents abroad. The most famous being Trotsky, who was assassinated in Mexico in 1940. And NKVD spies routinely gathered vital military secrets from friends and foes alike. They penetrated top-secret British and American nuclear facilities and provided Russian scientists with highly detailed information on America's development of the atom bomb. By the end of World War II, Soviet agents had infiltrated all the world's major military and political establishments, and many of the lesser ones. At the beginning of the 1950s, the NKVD got a new name, one that would instill terror in the Western world, the KGB. At that time, Soviet intelligence was the most effective and the most powerful in the world. Many Western scientists and intellectuals were grateful to the Soviet Union, which had lost over 20 million lives in the war against Hitler. Perhaps they felt they had survived because of Soviet sacrifices and efforts. They believed that this country, regardless of its political structure, deserved equal military status with the West, and first of all, with the United States. This mentality gave us access to the all-important military and scientific secrets of the West. This situation helped the KGB recruit new agents. Joseph Stalin and the Soviet leadership wanted to use their victory in the Second World War to expand Soviet influence into Eastern Europe and even farther to the West. The United States prepared contingency plans of its own. One plan even provided for a nuclear attack on 20 major Soviet cities and industrial centers, including Moscow and Leningrad. The line was drawn with the United States and Great Britain leading NATO countries on one side and the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact countries on the other. For the KGB, the United States became enemy number one. The Cold War had begun. In order to counteract Soviet expansion, the U.S. set up a chain of military bases capable of delivering nuclear strikes into the heart of Russia. Bases were located in Great Britain, Italy, Turkey, and many other countries. 
1946, we started working against the American and British military's strategic bases, which had been set up to encircle the Soviet Union. We made plans to destroy them in case of war. We had selected and trained quite a number of agents, which we had handpicked from our prisoners of war. They were the ones who were to carry out these operations. Beginning in 1946, Stalin initiated an active campaign to thwart perceived American influence within the Soviet Union, including within the KGB itself. Stalin wanted to cut off the country from all Western influence. He instituted show trials against so-called Westernizers. Along with tightening the screw against foreign influence, Stalin also started a fierce campaign against Soviet Jews as a result of the failure of his Mideast policy. In 1948, Stalin had planned to use Israel as a key Soviet stronghold in the Middle East. He knew that many of the Israeli leaders, such as President Golda Meir, were former socialists, born or educated in Russia. He believed that world Jewry would be grateful to the Soviet Union for its major contribution to the defeat of the Nazis. On Stalin's orders, Soviet intelligence secretly supported the Jews in Palestine in their struggle against the British. And the Soviet Union was one of the first to vote in the United Nations for the creation of the Jewish state. But from its very birth, it was evident that Israel had no intention of building a socialist state on the Soviet model. On the contrary, Israel looked to the U.S. as its closest ally. Stalin felt betrayed and turned his wrath on the Jews in his own country, from the most humble to the most prominent. Solomon Nihoyles was famous in the Soviet Union as an actor and theater director. He formed and chaired the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee. In 1943, Stalin sent Nihoyles on a war fundraising tour to the United States. Nihoyles fulfilled the mission and brought many American donations to Moscow. After the war, Stalin planned to use Mihoyles to collect $10 billion in donations from the West to help rebuild the Soviet Union. The failed Mideast policy changed everything. On January 13, 1948, Mihoyles had a so-called accident in Minsk. According to the official version, an unidentified truck hit and killed him. His body was brought to Moscow and buried in an official ceremony with honors. But soon afterward, Mihoyles was proclaimed an American spy. And his anti-fascist committee was banned as a nest of American spies. Only later would the truth come out. On that January night, Mihoyles had been invited to the country house of the local minister of security. He was given a lethal injection and his body was thrown under a truck driven by a Secret Service officer. Suddenly, all Jews were at risk. In the Soviet Union, the word Jew became synonymous with traitor. In the Soviet Secret Service, the purge of these alleged subversives was almost total. Many feared this as a signal that an increasingly paranoid and delusional Stalin would soon plunge the Soviet Union into a repeat of the bloody purges of the 1930s, and perhaps even provoke a nuclear war with the United States. Then, unexpectedly, in March 1953, the great dictator Joseph Stalin died. A new Soviet leader emerged, Nikita Khrushchev, and he would use the KGB agents as his frontline troops in the Cold War. In 1956, at a closed plenary session of the all-powerful Communist Party, Khrushchev exposed some of the horrors of Stalin's regime and of the secret service that had carried out his criminal dictates. Just the little he revealed caused a sensation. 
Many of those present cried, some even fainted. For the KGB, it was a time of uncertainty. After the Congress of the Communist Party in 1956, there were investigations into the illegal methods used in the secret security services. Many officers were dismissed. Some of them were punished. A lot of new people came into the KGB from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Institute for International Relations, and the Institute of Foreign Trade. In 1958, Khrushchev fired Ivan Serov, the thuggish head of the KGB. He had been heavily involved in Stalin's bloody purges. Then Alexander Shelepin received a call from the Kremlin. Just on the eve of the new year, Khrushchev called me in for a meeting. He said he would recommend me for the position of the new head of KGB. He said we need a new energetic man to lead the fight against the old elements in KGB. To carry on the process of rehabilitation of the purge victims. I said, Nikita Sergeyevich, I greatly respect you, but I cannot accept the position. I can't. I'm scared even to walk past the headquarters. I just can't. He said, you should not worry about it. Within the Soviet Union, Khrushchev's spring thaw was an attempt to lessen the consequences of Stalinism. He opened the notorious gulags, scenes of unspeakable atrocities. He released political prisoners and rehabilitated the reputations of thousands of victims of the purges. On the other hand, Khrushchev became a militant cold warrior, sending in troops to crush the Hungarian uprising of 1956 and pounding on his desk at the United Nations, shouting that he would bury the United States. Khrushchev didn't hesitate to use KGB operatives in his attempt to achieve that goal. The first victims of the KGB were Russian opponents in exile from the communist regime or defectors to the West. They were traitors sentenced to death by our court. Traitors had to be executed, but the West was hiding them changing their appearance with plastic surgeries, moving them from one place to another. One night there, another day here. Yes, we were hunting them, and we didn't always succeed in finding them, but sometimes we did. There were cases of fatal car accidents, or somebody would die in the street from alcohol poisoning. Others just kick the bucket, with our help or without. It's difficult to tell for sure now. As for the political killings, well, those were exceptional cases. In 1957, while Moscow hosted a World Peace Festival for students, a KGB assassin killed Lev Rebet, a vociferous anti-Soviet thinker in Germany. Two years later, Stefan Bandera, the leader of the Ukrainian nationalist organization abroad, was murdered in his home in Munich, Germany. Both Rebid and Bandera were murdered by one of the KGB's most reliable and expert assassins, Bodan Stashinsky. His method was both ingenious and horrific. He sprayed his victims with a high dosage of cyanide mist. They inhaled the lethal cyanide and suffered immediate and fatal cardiac arrest. The KGB regarded killing people abroad, as well as in the Soviet Union, as a normal part of its operations. It stopped in the early 1960s, not because it had decided that it was wrong to kill people, but because there were several defectors in Germany. The Soviet Union subsequently decided that the risks of being found out in future were such that it wasn't prudent to continue. The most startling defector was the arch-assassin himself, Stashinsky. In August 1961, one day before construction began on the Berlin Wall, Stashinsky and his East German wife gave themselves up to American authorities in West Germany. 
Stashinsky admitted killing Rebbit and Bandera. He was tried and sentenced to eight years in prison. Later, he was secretly released and taken to the United States. In June 1957, FBI agents barged into the studio of a New York photographer who called himself Rudolf Abel. They had warrants to search the studio and arrest Abel. Throughout the arrest and search, Abel remained calm. At one point, he asked to go to the bathroom. There, Abel, in reality a KGB spy, destroyed most of the incriminating materials in his possession. Later, he won some respect from the FBI interrogators with his sharp intellect, the breadth of his knowledge, and the skill of his spycraft. Abel had entered the U.S. through Canada in 1948 using a false passport. Over the course of nine years, he sat up and ran from his New York studio what was perhaps the most effective Soviet spy operation ever. Colonel Rudolf Abel was probably the best spy that Soviets ever had in the United States. He was more a spy master than a spy. In other words, he ran a, uh, a, an organization. He was trained in the Soviet Union, fluent in several languages. He ran a network out of New York people would report to him and he would handle their reports. I believe to this day the extent of his activities is not known. Rudolf Abel's agents passed him information on nuclear weapons, the newest strategic and technological developments in the American military, as well as highly confidential political secrets. Abel was sentenced to 30 years in prison. The Russians, however, wanted their valuable spy back. Their chance came in 1961. On May 1st, Soviet missiles shot down an American spy plane, the U-2, over Soviet territory. The pilot, Francis Gary Powers, was captured. The Soviets offered to exchange powers for Abel. By an official letter, President Kennedy agreed to the exchange of the two top spies. On February 10, 1962, the two spies stood on opposite sides of this bridge, which separated West Berlin from the East. Boris Nalivaiko was part of the KGB contingent. First of all, we identified Abel as they identified Powers. Then Powers and Abel started walking toward each other, staring, as if consuming each other with their eyes. After they passed each other, Abel stopped and turned his head to look once more at Powers. And Powers, though free now to go to his side, turned his head to get another look at Abel. It was a transcendent moment. We get Francis Gary Power and the Soviets get Abel back. And all of the secrets that Abel may have had uh, go with him and he becomes, as far as people know, uh, one of the big training officers in uh, the Soviet uh, spy schools. The FBI had put a stop to Abel, but not to Soviet spying in the U.S. Ten months after the historic exchange of Abel for Powers, a sergeant of the American Army was informed that he had been promoted to major in the Soviet Army. With the promotion came Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev's personal congratulations. For 11 years, Sergeant Robert Lee Johnson, a U.S. Army soldier, had been on the payroll of the Soviet Union. As a security officer at U.S. missile bases in California, he passed along invaluable military information, including at one time a sample of missile fuel to the Russians. But he filed his most damaging reports after he was transferred to security at the U.S. Armed Forces Courier Center 
at Paris's Orly Airport. The courier center was a key communications transit center for materials and code systems being sent from the States to NATO headquarters, as well as to American forces in Europe and the U.S. Sixth Fleet. In February 1961, Johnson walked out of the courier center with a small briefcase stuffed with secret documents. KGB officer Vitaly Ozhumov was Johnson's handler in France. We had two tag teams working on the case. The first team took the documents from Johnson and brought them back to the city where they handed it over to a second team. The second team smuggled the materials into the Soviet embassy. There, our specialists opened the envelopes, photocopied the papers, put everything back, resealed the envelopes, and returned them to the first team to return to Johnson. This operation was repeated 17 times. For Moscow, it was an incredible windfall. The Soviets got unprecedented access to vital American military secrets, including U.S. and NATO defense plans in Europe, the quantity and location of nuclear missiles in Europe, and most importantly, descriptions of American coding systems. The operation was slick and extremely professional. It might have gone on for years, but for the unexpected. In 1964, a KGB officer, Yuri Nozinko, defected to the West. He exposed Robert Johnson, who was subsequently arrested, tried, and sentenced to 25 years in prison. Johnson's arrest was a great loss for the KGB, but not a fatal one. KGB operatives were masters at compromising and recruiting new spies. If the KGB gets some material, compromising material on a person, mainly it, connected, it is connected either with sexual or with homosexual affairs, or something, they usually show the material. If a person rejects the offer, they send this material to his superiors or to the relatives. But the most popular approach when you recruit a person is gradual approach. On an ideological basis, you see common ideology, or you're a left-winger, I'm a left-winger. George Blake was recruited because of his ideology. During the Korean War, he worked as a British intelligence officer. But Blake was captured by the North Koreans and in 1951 recruited by the KGB. In 1953, he was released from a prisoner of war camp and returned to Britain. He resumed work in anti-Soviet intelligence. No one suspected that George Blake had become a double agent. As Blake himself later admitted, he betrayed almost 400 Western agents working against the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc. George Blake was informed of one of the most ambitious Western intelligence operations against the Soviets in the 1950s. It was Operation Gold Stopwatch, a joint British CIA operation to dig a tunnel from West Berlin into East Berlin to access and tap into key East German and Soviet communication lines. A delegation of uh, senior CIA officers came to London uh, to discuss with the British side um, the details of such an operation. I was the secretary who kept the notes of the meeting, so I was fully informed of what was going on. The information concerning the operation, you could get on a small piece of paper because all that was needed really was to know uh, where which cables were going to be attacked where the tunnel ran at my next meeting with my Soviet contact I was able to pass this information the Russians seizing on the value of keeping their knowledge of the tunnel secret let it exist for two years spreading a great deal of misinformation over the tapped lines Finally, in 1956, Soviet technicians accidentally discovered the tunnel while making cable repairs. Nobody suspected George Blake. 
He was revealed only after a defector, the deputy head of Polish intelligence, Mikhail Golinevsky, exposed him. On April 12, 1961, the same day that Yuri Gagarin became the world's first man in space, a British newspaper revealed that Blake had been arrested on espionage charges. Blake received an unprecedented prison sentence, 42 years. Later, he would say that Gagarin's space flight and the triumph of the Soviet space program was a major source of moral comfort. It confirmed for him that he had been right to help the world's most socially progressive country build a better future for humankind. In 1966, with the help of an Irish Republican Army member, Blake managed to escape. He spent 24 hours in a hidden compartment of a minivan that brought him to the border of West and East Germany. His arrival in the East was as awkward as it was unbelievable to the guard who greeted him. There was an East German frontier guard and I went up to him and I said I wanted to talk to the Soviet officer and then after about half an hour uh, a young man came and I said who I was and would he please report to Moscow to say that I had arrived. He said well it was late, it was by that time two o'clock in the morning and uh, there was very little he could do at that time, but he would um, make arrangements for me to spend the night at the frontier post. And the next morning, about eight o'clock, the door opened and in stepped one of the comrades from the Soviet intelligence service with whom I had worked for several years in London and who knew me personally. And when he saw me, he said, that's him. In Moscow, George Blake was rewarded with a large flat in a country house. He married a Russian woman and worked as a translator for more than 30 years until his death in Moscow in 1996. His counterpart, a high-ranking Russian military intelligence officer, was not so lucky. In the spring of 1961, Soviet Army Colonel Oleg Penkovsky offered his services to American and British intelligence. Penkovsky was a remarkable catch. He'd received Russia's highest military awards for bravery in World War II. He'd mingled with the leading members of Soviet society, and his friends and patrons were highly positioned military officers. But Oleg Penkovsky had developed a vehement hatred for the Soviet regime. The American and British agents who worked with him were taken aback by his intensity. He went so far as to seriously suggest planting small nuclear devices near key strategic installations in Moscow, such as the headquarters of the KGB, the general headquarters of the military and the Communist Party headquarters. He even urged the Americans to make a preventive nuclear strike and annihilate the city of Moscow in order to decapitate the Soviet monster. Penkovsky began spying for the Americans at a time when U.S.-Soviet relations were rapidly deteriorating. In an attempt to alleviate tensions, President Kennedy met with Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev in Vienna in June 1961. The meeting ended in a stalemate, but Penkovsky was able to give the CIA a classified Russian report on the meeting, detailing how the Russians intended to respond to the Americans. Two months later, Khrushchev ordered the construction of the Berlin Wall. In the resultant crisis, American tanks faced off against Russian tanks. Only 50 yards and barbed wire separated the two superpowers. Penkovsky's espionage reports helped to form the measured American response to the crisis. Then, in the autumn of 1962, an American U-2 spy plane provided definitive evidence of the presence of Soviet nuclear missiles in Cuba, a mere 90 miles from Florida. 
top-secret Soviet missile manual stolen by Penkovsky gave the Americans critical information on missile assembly procedures, launch times, and trajectories. These missiles were capable of striking major military bases in urban centers in the continental United States. Kennedy demanded that Khrushchev remove the missiles. Khrushchev stonewalled. The world teetered on the brink of war. But Kennedy had an ace in the hole. Oleg Penkovsky. His secret reports detailed the Soviet Union's strategic plans in the event of war and provided a complete description of Soviet strategic nuclear missile forces, including the number of nuclear warheads and their capacity. Penkovsky's information revealed that the Soviet Union was decisively lagging behind the West in the nuclear arms race by a ratio of 17 to 1. Another player suddenly became important in this tense showdown. He was a KGB agent based in the Soviet embassy in Washington. The CIA knew him as Fomin. His real name was Alexander Feklisov. At the height of the crisis, Alexander Feklisov and American journalist John Scully met in a Washington restaurant. Feklisov knew that Scully was close to the Kennedys. Scully was aware of the nature of Feklisov's real activities. On Friday, October 26th, we met at the Occidental Grill restaurant. The situation was increasingly aggravating. Scully said, it's a hard time for Kennedy, you know. The army is pushing for a military solution. They want to go in and bomb all the Soviet installations on Cuba and then invade Cuba and depose Fidel Castro. I answered, if you invade Cuba, then Khrushchev will retaliate, most likely in West Berlin. Feklisov reported the conversation to the Soviet ambassador. Scully briefed President Kennedy. That same evening, Scully and Feklisov met again. Scully told me at the very beginning of our meeting that he was authorized to come by the U.S. administration. He took out a piece of paper to read. He said, the Soviet Union must dismantle all missile launch sites on Cuba and remove them from Cuba under the supervision of the United Nations. Then, the United States will take a public pledge not to invade Cuba. Peklisov drafted a cable about this extremely important meeting with Kennedy's representative to be forwarded to Moscow with the U.S. proposal. When Feklisov came to the Soviet ambassador in the U.S. to ask him to send the cable about the meeting with Scully, the ambassador refused. He did not dare. Then Feklisov sent the cable directly to the KGB, addressed to me personally. I had the cable put on Khrushchev's desk. Time was running out. Then suddenly, Moscow broadcast the news that Khrushchev would remove the missiles from Cuba. The world stepped back from the brink of nuclear destruction. In this Washington restaurant, there's a small commemorative plaque on top of one of the tables. It reads, at this table during the tense moments of the Cuban crisis in October 1962, a Russian offer to withdraw missiles from Cuba was passed by the mysterious Mr. X to ABC TV correspondent John Scully. 
On the basis of this meeting, the threat of a possible nuclear war was avoided. Khrushchev's erratic policies, both abroad and at home, had made him powerful enemies within the Soviet hierarchy. Some experts suggest that Oleg Penkovsky may have been used by them to get at Khrushchev. Penkovsky was an officer with limited clearances. He had no authorization to know the secrets of the Soviet general headquarters, such as how many strategic missiles we had, what kind they were, how they were armed. But somehow Penkovsky found out somebody had to give him access to these documents. Oleg Penkovsky's secret informants are a mystery to this day. But it is known that the army's top echelons were increasingly dissatisfied with Khrushchev and his nuclear brinksmanship. It may be that by channeling information through Penkovsky, the army's top echelons were trying to undermine Khrushchev. By now, time was running out for Penkovsky. The KGB was hot on his trail. We followed him for a long time, twice on various pretexts. We prevented him from going abroad. We wanted to trace all his handlers and communication links. This is the apartment building in Moscow where Oleg Penkovsky lived. On November 2nd, 1962, a few days after the peaceful outcome of the Cuban Missile Crisis, Penkovsky was arrested. KGB counterintelligence had been effective. Penkovsky managed to work for the West for only a year and a half. In a highly unusual move, Penkovsky was put on public trial. No spy has ever been tried like that in the Soviet Union. Neither before nor since. It's a shame for the country. We caught a military intelligence colonel spying red-handed, so let's kill him, kick him till he's dead, burn him alive in a furnace, do whatever you want. But why expose him to the whole world? My explanation is that it was necessary to show the world that he was alone, acting on his own with no collaborators. It was a show trial, to prove that there was no conspiracy. But I think that there was a group of highly placed people acting through him. Pankowski was sentenced to death and executed. But by then, Khrushchev's grip on power was slipping. His deputy, Leonid Brezhnev, wanted him out of the way. Brezhnev met secretly with Vladimir Semichostny, head of the KGB. Brezhnev said we should find a way to physically remove Khrushchev. Maybe poison him or, or just shoot him. I told him it's impossible because I personally cannot do it alone. I must get men from his security service to do that. I must give them details. Then Brezhnev asked if we could arrest him. I said, Leonid Ilyich. If you want the KGB to take part in this, only the plenary session of the Central Committee can give such an order. I won't do it otherwise. In 1964, Khrushchev was deposed. Leonid Brezhnev became Russia's new premier. Like his predecessor, Brezhnev strongly supported the KGB as a secret weapon of the Cold War. Soon he would land a valuable American traitor. In 1968, Czech Premier Alexander Dubček, riding a wave of popularity, moved to make his country more democratic. Leonid Brezhnev crushed the Prague Spring with tanks. The KGB was among the first to feel the backlash of the brutal suppression of the democratic movement in Czechoslovakia. 1968 was a black year for the KGB. After the events in Czechoslovakia, some of our foreign agents working for ideological reasons refused to cooperate with us. The Soviets felt the reverberations for years. 
1971, in an unprecedented move, the British government expelled 105 Soviets suspected of espionage activities. Similar expulsions followed in other European countries. It was an unanticipated and serious blow to the KGB. It became harder to place our agents. The Americans and British started doing what we had been doing since the October Revolution. They infiltrated our service even more. At times they created an impression that we had a big success, and years later we found out that we had been taken in by a double agent. We became cautious, afraid to make a move. They achieved their goal. But even in its decline, the KGB remained a force to be reckoned with, as the Americans were to discover to their great cost. One of the KGB's most valuable recruits in the late 1960s was an American naval officer named John Walker. About 1967, and the records vary whether it was 67, 68, Walker literally walked into the Russian embassy and offered to spy for them. He gave them copies of classified communications. He gave them access to key cards, which could read our crypto machines. These were the family jewels of American intelligence. John Walker passed so many code keys to his KGB handlers that the Russians were able to decode over a million secret U.S. military messages. Among the many casualties of John Walker's betrayals were a series of American bombing missions during the Vietnam War. Too often, the CIA and Pentagon got the impression that, impossible as it seemed, the North Vietnamese seemed fully aware of American bombing runs, targets, timing, and payload. Before the planes were even airborne, the North Vietnamese were ready, thanks to John Walker. Walker was a new type of agent, completely uninterested in ideology, passionately interested in power and money. For 17 years, Walker evaded notice and suspicion. Finally, a KGB defector named him as a longtime Soviet mole. Walker was arrested and sentenced to life in prison. Under Brezhnev, the stagnation of Soviet society accelerated and KGB repressions escalated to levels unseen in previous years. The so-called establishment didn't blame itself. Instead, it laid the blame for a country's ills on the dissident movement. Soviet dissidents had been mounting a campaign to expose the corruption of the Soviet state and the cruelty of the KGB. The head of the KGB from 1967 to 1981, and um, shortly thereafter, uh, leader of the Soviet Union for two years, uh, Andropov, uh, was obsessed by what he called ideological subversion, ideological sabotage. And he believed that from the moment uh, that a dissident like Andrei Sakharov, for example, was free to put his views to call for the introduction of democratic values into, and the destruction of the one-party state, the whole system might begin to crumble. Nobel laureate physicist Andrei Sakharov was the father of the Russian hydrogen bomb. He became the most outspoken and fearless leader of the Soviet dissident movement. The Soviet authorities retaliated by sending him into indefinite exile in the town of Gorky. With the help of doctors, the KGB did everything possible to drive the scientist insane. They watched him 24 hours a day. But Sakharov was still lucky. Thousands of other lesser-known dissidents were forced to serve their terms in mental institutions and prisons. All the way through the Cold War, the KGB is obsessed with dealing with its ideological opponents. It's not simply an intelligence gathering organization. In the last years of the great Soviet empire, the ever-growing number of KGB defectors to the West marked the decline of the once mighty communist state. 
More Secret Service officers fled to the West in the last 15 years of the Cold War than in all the previous years of the Soviet Union's existence. In 1974, British intelligence recruited a high flyer in Soviet intelligence in the KGB, Oleg Gordievsky. And by the time that um, he was discovered in 1985, he was actually the head of Soviet intelligence operations in Britain. He made one of the great escapes uh, in the history of, uh, of intelligence. He became the first and only KGB officer in the history of the Soviet Union to manage to escape from the Soviet Union while he was under uh, surveillance. I worked for Great Britain in total for 11 years. From the very start, I knew I could be arrested and executed at any moment. Then the KGB caught me. I was taken from London to Moscow and the KGB drugged and interrogated me. Even under drugs, Oleg Gordievsky revealed nothing. But he knew his time was running out. My apartment was completely bugged. KGB agents followed me in the street wherever I went. How did I feel? I was terribly scared. I felt like a rabbit followed by a pack of pythons. I knew they could kill me any day. It was a terrible feeling. There was a moment during the days of the Moscow International Youth Festival when they eased up their grip on me, and I decided I must flee. One morning, Gordievsky donned his jogging outfit and left his Moscow apartment for his morning jog. First, he followed his usual route. Then, he simply disappeared. According to the plan of escape, Gordievsky was to get to Leningrad. He did so by frequently changing his mode of transport from car to train and back again to shake off any KGB tail. Near Leningrad, he climbed into a car sent especially for the rescue operation by British intelligence. A few hours later, Oleg Gordievsky successfully crossed the Finnish border in the trunk of the car. By the mid-80s, the game was winding to a close. In 1985, the new Soviet leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, declared a radical shift in Soviet policy. It was called Perestroika. The old guard, like the head of the KGB, Vladimir Khrushchev, felt that a catastrophe was brewing and that Gorbachev was doing nothing about it. They saw everything they had cherished and believed in disintegrating. They were convinced something had to be done. Vladimir Khrushchev was the head of the KGB, and he came to the conclusion that Gorbachev had to go. At the end of August 1991, Khrushchev and his co-conspirators announced on Soviet television that Gorbachev was sick and declared martial law to safeguard the country. I read several government reports on this, classified information. I got an impression that the KGB was, not surprisingly, at the center of the coup against Gorbachev. But Russia had gone too far down the road of reform. The people of Moscow rose in protest. After two days of a dramatic standoff, the coup leaders lost their nerve and retreated. They were arrested. The head of the KGB, Vladimir Khrushchev, was interrogated in Moscow. But Gorbachev's own poor performance during the coup cost him the support of the country. The new hero was Russian President Boris Yeltsin. Addressing a crowd of thousands gathered in front of KGB headquarters in downtown Moscow, Yeltsin promised Russians that the old KGB would be reformed. That promise is what spurred a cheering crowd to remove the symbol of the old communist regime. The monument to the founder of Soviet secret intelligence, Felix Sterzhinsky. By the end of 1991, 
the old KGB ceased to exist along with the Soviet Union itself. A long story full of sound and fury, of deceits and betrayals, of death and torture, and at times of great bravery, daring, and ingenuity had come to an end.